Kaiser Adolf Hitler the Hohenzollern escape prisoner of war jail in Yugoslavia in 1959. 2020. Happiness is a warm gun. The makeshift prisoner of war jail and working class posh spinster's apartment on the other side of the bars for the fake engagement to Sadie Einstein, the Kaiser Adolf Hitler the Hohenzollern was held prisoner in between December 1943 and late 1959 was run by a man called Joe Rewold. It was a converted subway train station that never had the trains diverted through it. They still ran over it near the jail. Joe Rewold was an overly loud North American living a lifestyle in Yugoslavia, complete with a twang accent. A plank town Wild West type, who yelled everything in a slightly panicked sounding lunatic high pitched quiet scream on sedatives style. He almost certainly inspired the cartoon character Yosemite Sam. You could bank on it. There is solid evidence that Joe was a former army general in the United States of America, who was suddenly given a dishonorable discharge after an incident involving native North Americans that he was heavily involved in. He was never charged or trialed for the illegal acts, including deaths, in the incident, all he got was the discharge in private disgrace. He fled the USA and North America afterwards and settled in Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia itself was partly set up by people from the USA as a project bloc nation. Those involved from the USA and what became part of the bloc Yugoslavia knew each other extremely well. Joe Rewold types ended up there. Enough said. Joe always seemed hysterical in some way, eventually including due to who and what he saw on the other side of the bars every day he was at work as the jail governor. He knew it was a horrible thing to do to Adolf. He was always just out of fingertip reach from Kaiser Adolf through the bars. Kaiser Adolf began exercising in his cell like a makeshift home gym in 1946. He became way too muscular to be confronted easily. There were a few incidents which caused everything to be moved out of arm's reach through the bars, with nothing he could grab and pull on. Being pulled forward suddenly into prison bars wasn't a pleasant experience. Joe Rewold went on an alcohol and drug-fueled killing spree in late 1959 with his hunting pistols. Smith and Wesson 1923 six-shot pistols. One had something like heat at Joe's engraved on it. Joe had gotten quite drunk, was on something chemical, and had a raging screaming argument with his old lady at their house. One of his sons was not at home that day. He had been a trainee at the jail for a couple of years and had guarded Kaiser Adolf's cell himself during his training to take over from his father Joe. He was 19. He was at a strange national military service pre-winter camp and high school musical thing. There was lots of singing. Very Yugoslavian. The rest of the family was living in and around the main house and property. Joe went completely insane, got extremely drunk, and shot and killed his old lady. He then decided family life wasn't his thing grabbed his guns, ammunition, and bottles of spirits, and went to hunt down his entire family. Joe shot and killed everyone in the extended family, traveling from one location to the next to murder every single one of them. Then checked the time, and decided he may as well go to work at the jail to start his shift. His one remaining son at National Service Camp ended up supplying a sperm in 1961 that was used to conceive the second oldest female who was pretending to be my older sister when I was born in 1972. Joe was her grandfather. Joe shot and killed, regardless how many shots it took, everyone he encountered in any way on his way to work. He then shot the guard who greeted him at the door to the underground subway jail dead at the door. When he slipped in past the body and closed the door, it slid sideways and blocked that exit. The door couldn't be opened after Joe went in. Joe clocked in as usual, turned on all the film cameras used as security-style surveillance cameras as usual, then headed for Kaiser Adolf's cell. He shot everyone dead on the way to the cell, and by the time he arrived, there was only him and Kaiser Adolf left in the building. Kaiser Adolf had been stuck there for over 15 years, still wearing the formal dinner clothes he wore the night he was abducted in December 1943, chained to the interior of the cell with a system of chains on pulleys. He could move around, but had to lug the chains with him if he did. Sadie Einstein was still spending most of the working week at the jail living in the makeshift apartment on the other side of the bars to Adolf. She had been for over 15 years as well. It was originally intended to be her spinster's digs for around 9 to 12 months. She did self-abort the inbred extortion plot herself in April 1944, so the extended use of the area was likely something she took in a responsibility for herself in some way. Sadie was away visiting her only daughter she had prior to World War II that day. Joe plonked himself down unsteadily on the guard's chair, slurring his words badly. He then abruptly offered Kaiser Adolf one opportunity to play a game called Gun Roulette and started explaining the rules. Most people know it as Russian roulette. Joe asked Adolf to play, and then said that if he didn't say yes, he would just shoot him immediately. There was a quiet argument that followed. 
In the end, after being threatened with being shot dead immediately, Adolf said well that is a 1 in 6 chance of committing suicide for 3 turns, but you might shoot yourself in your 3. Okay. Joe had two guns and was ready to shoot Kaiser Adolf if he tried to find and fire the one bullet in the six chamber gun at him to make sure he wasn't going to try to do him harm. His other gun was resting on his knee, pointed at Kaiser Adolf and ready to shoot. The game, not recommended here in any way, involved one bullet and five empty chambers in a six shot pistol. Pulling the barrel out, covering it with your hand, spinning it around, resetting it, cocking it, holding it up against your head pointed at your brain and pulling the trigger. Anywhere you want, against the temple, under your chin. If the gun didn't go off, other person's turn. If it didn't go off in six turns, game over. If it did, the survivor gets to keep anything they want of the dead person's body, particularly the gun and any valuables. A one in six chance of death, three turns each if it is two people. Joe prepared the game gun and slid it to Kaiser Adolf under the bars. Kaiser Adolf followed the instructions and started saying that he really didn't want to shoot himself. It turned into a sweaty, nervous, little back and forth argument that was almost polite. Joe threatened to just shoot Adolf dead anyway if he didn't take his turn. Kaiser Adolf one gotta do it, do it, pull the trigger, do it from Joe. Adolf verbally squirmed, and Joe just kept saying fucking do it. In the end Joe watched as if suddenly fascinated when Kaiser Adolf held the gun under his chin and paused for a short time, then pulled the trigger and got a blank sounding click. Joe the loon laughed very hard, cackling about how hilarious it was, rocking back and forwards with his head going from side to side, as if it was the funniest thing ever. The look on your face and other similar sentences. He stopped to catch his breath and said the funniest bit was when you said you didn't really want to shoot yourself. You've been stuck here for over 15 years, without a change of clothes or a bath, eating the same meal every day, chained to the wall, and you said you didn't really want to shoot yourself. Kaiser Adolf slid the gun to Joe under the bars, who stopped it with one of his boots with mirrors glued to them, still laughing hard. Joe let go of his safety gun pointed at Kaiser Adolf, obtained the roulette gun off the floor, put it down by his side, pulled the barrel out, hid it with his hand still chuckling, spun the barrel around, clicked the barrel in, cocked it, looked at Adolf, held the gun against his temple pointing slightly downwards, and shot himself through the head with his first turn. When he fell off the chair dead, he lurched, fell forward and sideways, landed, twitched for a few seconds, and stopped moving. There was brains and skull fragments, lots of blood. And a shiny set of governor's keys, to the chains, shackles, cell, everything, laid out slightly forwards from his body on the floor. Kaiser Adolf said oh, no, that's disgusting, horrified. Then saw the shiny set of keys within easy reach of his hand through the bars. Kaiser Adolf one thought oh, he shot himself. And there's a set of keys on his uniform. They call it roulette because it can be like a croupier laying out winnings in a smooth here is your profit sweeping hand motion, apparently. Usually valuables, wallet, keys, identification, souvenirs, and keepsakes. Not that I want to sound like it is a viable game or justify it being played or anything. If at some point in the past it stopped being played forever, then that is well and good. Kaiser Adolf obtained the keys from the body, covered in blood, skull fragments, and brains, by using his enormous daily prison exercising muscles to pull the body to the bars, and then the keys off Joe's uniform. They were slippery and it was gruesome. He tried the keys in all the locks, one by one. They unlocked everything. He extricated himself from the chains completely and tried unlocking the cell door. The cell door, made to look like the Brandenburg Gate, slid open. Kaiser Adolf decided to grab the game gun and take it with him, with some ammunition, as Joe had said he could. He made his way carefully through the prison to attempt to get outside into the open air, which quickly became his sole focus once he unlocked himself. The dead bodies of everyone else in the building were strewn around where Joe had shot them on the way in. When he got as far as he could with the keys of the uniform, he had two guns and some ammunition with him. When he got to the exit door, there was blood seeping through the gap between the door and the door frame, and he could not get it open. Kaiser Adolf looked around for another way out. There were air vents and ducts, but the prison was booby-trapped in all those areas, with bare electric wires spread all over the interior like electric fencing. Adolf had two-inch thick concrete shoes on though, and he had a good scientific knowledge of electricity. He knew the electricity would not flow through him and earth if he only touched one live wire at a time, and did not cross them over or touch them up against anything, as his concrete shoes would prevent the electricity from earthing through his feet. Theoretically he could grab them with his bare hands to remove them and it wouldn't electrocute him. He moved them carefully by hand, one wire at a time, one hand at a time. Shooting things that he did not have a key for was also a viable option. Kaiser Adolf climbed out of the building through the air vent ducts and came up out a grate right in the middle of train lines. 
he felt an outdoor open air breeze. The first natural outdoor cool breeze he had felt at his body in fifteen and a half years. He escaped the proximity of the prison and quickly decided to attempt to head north towards Italy instead of towards the seemingly illogical destination of Greece. He picked his direction and started shuffling away in his concrete shoes. He went in the wrong direction. He saw a sign that clearly stated how far it was to Greece and then another that had a smaller number next to it after he had traveled quite a distance. He tried not to cry with an I've gone the wrong way. He had to double back after getting his bearings. He was confronted in the days immediately after his escape by two uniformed men with a gun who told him to stop so they could check him. Prisoners of war and other inmates in the former Yugoslavia were often let loose in their prison gear so people could hunt them down and apprehend them for something to do, with prizes awarded each time one got caught. Usually provided the prisoner was weak and feeble. The chasers used to think it was entertaining to watch them try to take the opportunity to get away for good, as if it were weird fun. They assumed he was another one released for a fun hunt. They asked him to stop. Kaiser Adolf refused to stop and kept going, so they threatened to shoot him. He told them he was not stopping and kept moving. They shot him twice, once through the buttock and one bullet that lodged in his back. When they approached him, they thought he was going to fall into their arms between their shoulders to be carried away back to wherever he was released from. When they moved to grab him, he suddenly grabbed them by the side of the heads by the hair, and smashed their heads together with a solid cracking noise, knocking them both unconscious. One was left bleeding from the side of the head. He then took a deep wounded breath, raised his head in the air, and yelled freedom in German in a long, drawn out, loud, screaming wounded moan. Which he later said was the most embarrassing thing he ever did in his life. After finally busting the leg shackle open, where he accidentally caused himself a deep stab wound, and managing to remove the one around his arm, he shuffled ran, walked, and traveled over 1,000 kilometers to northern Italy, through Luni, Yugoslavia. The main issue on the way was nighttime spotlights used to illuminate things. Operated by night shift workers, they were waved around like lighthouse batman beams, up and down the streets in set patterns. The operators would follow the set patterns, and when finished with the run, would return them all to the starting point, and point them at it. Sometimes a Yugoslavian flag on a flagpole, lit from every direction they were using them. Trying to time the final beaming at the flag so that all spotlights returned to the flag at once, as if it was ballet or something. He studied them quietly, noted the pattern and moved to stay out of the beams. It was bizarrely easy given the routine. After the encounter that resulted in his bullet wounds, he evaded all snipers, checkpoints, police, military, spotlights, barbed wire, alarm sirens, guards, etc. He entered what is now Slovenia, and then walked across the Italian border without being intercepted. He was exhausted and had lost a lot of blood. His feet had blistered inside his concrete shoes, but he could not find a way to get them off. He ended up seeing a dim light like buildings in the distance. It was a country convent like a basic castle outside a very small town in northeastern Italy, run by minor organized crime. He got their attention. The door was opened by a female looking like a mother superior of some type, with a candle. She looked like a cross between the paintings, Weeping Woman and Mona Lisa. He told her he was wounded and could he get some help. She gave him a seat inside the outer door and went to get the priest. He was told to fuck off by a man who looked like a priest, as he was too smelly. The priest closed the inner door and leant up against saying oh, no. Oh, no. The nun said what? He said that's Adolf Hitler, what is he doing here? Oh, no. She said who? Adolf banged on the door asking to be let in as he was wounded and needed help. He had a protracted argument through the door where he said he would have to walk somewhere else and asked to be let in saying he was wounded. He ended up banging on the door repeatedly, bashing it with the side of his fist, letting the pounding do the talking, whilst the priest moaned about who it was at the door and how he got there, telling him to fuck off repeatedly. Kaiser Adolf yelled that he had blisters on his feet and had been shot in the back and buttocks and was losing blood. Then returned to banging on the door forcefully saying let me in. They agreed to let him in and sit on a block of stone just inside the main door. He told them he was Kaiser Adolf Hitler the Hohenzollern of Germany, he'd been a prisoner, he didn't know how many years exactly, in Yugoslavia, and could they please help him and get the authorities so he could speak to them. The nun, possibly the mother superior, decided to get the convent camera out after the priest had disappeared further into the building. Nearly every convent in Italy had one, and the residents of each one liked to practice every now and then. The excuse for the cameras was just in case a statue started crying or something as a joke. When she returned with the camera, she gave him a piece of slightly gooey and pleasantly smelling cheese with something with it that smelled like parmesan. 
he sat down to wait on the concrete block, leaving blood on it from his wounds, and decided to slowly take a small nibble out of something he had not eaten in nearly sixteen years, after the smell of it had gotten in his nostrils. Whilst he was prisoner, he had been fed nothing but the main course from the dinner he was abducted at. Slow cooked Rubik's Cube like beefsteak meat loaf on request, at least three times a day, three green vegetables, and scalloped potatoes per meal. The people who prepared it claimed they were going to charge him one million dollars a stake whilst he was prisoner of war. An attempt to torture him into playing along with their inbred baby extortion terrorism plan. The nun set up the camera and took a photo of him just as his eyes rolled back in his head due to the taste of the cheese hitting his tongue. When he sat down in the convent in Italy in 1959, he was still wearing the clothes he was wearing to dinner in December 1943, including the remains of his top hat and overcoat. His clothes hand repaired multiple times with whatever he could find. His shoes had been taken off whilst he was unconscious in 1943 or 1944, and concrete molded around them, or used as molds to make concrete versions, and he had concrete shoes on his feet that he could not remove. He had a broken shackle for a chain to pass through around his leg above the knee, was injured where he removed an arm shackle, had a deep small one centimeter wide stab wound down to the bone on one leg. His right leg was more blood than material, mainly due to the bullet wounds to his back and buttocks, and he had several other injuries. The scars from those bullet wounds were obvious to me the day I was born when he held me up against his chest in 1972. He had traveled, mostly on foot, in the concrete shoes, around the distance from Kosovo to the convent just inside the Italian northeast border. He was photographed several times whilst he was in the convent, including after he took his first shower in nearly 16 years. The concrete shoes had to be smashed off. They took a photograph of him standing up in a borrowed priest's smock with a bag of personal belongings dangling from his hand that contained his sealed dye matrix that was on his clothes when he was abducted in December 1943 and the gun Joe had shot himself with and a few bits and pieces. It ended up being used on the cover of the Guns N' Roses mm -hmm. Use Your Illusion 1 and 2 releases without anyone really knowing it was him in the convent in 1959 in the photograph. There is a glimpse of the gruesome state of his feet in the image. He had to talk the convent residents through what they could do to help him. Like they were total morons. Anything about helping him with his wounds got a distracted stare. He had to explain to a male in the convent how to mix iodine with other substance and dilute it so it could be used as a disinfectant. The blank distracted moron followed his instructions and collected what he said was required. Whilst he was explaining why iodine had to be mixed and diluted, the moron suddenly tried to pour raw iodine on an open wound on his leg, whilst he was talking to see what happened. Kaiser Adolf reacted with a reflex short jab punch at the vial he was tipping over, to stop extremely painful raw iodine getting in an open wound. He accidentally got the person holding the vial a glancing blow on the jaw on the way through. They decided to call the police, and make an assault complaint. Whilst they were waiting and claiming to try to help him with the rest of his wounds, particularly his feet, there were other incidents. At one point a convent resident appeared to try to sever the balls of his feet with a razor, as if helping him with his wounds. They took a quick, badly executed swipe at one, and muttered they had to come off. It was later established when interviewing them that they tried to do it to adjust his upright standing position to look more like crazy fake physicist Albert Einstein, who always stood with a backward lean. The police arrived and took him to the police station to lay assault charges. He was interviewed and said that he was Kaiser Adolf Hitler the Hohenzollern of Germany, he'd been a prisoner for 10, 13, he didn't know how many years. His date of birth was the 20th of April, 1889, and could they please get the authorities so he could speak to them? They instead proceeded towards charging him with assault and laid a preliminary charge with paperwork. They took statements from the convent residents about the incident and decided it was self-offense on his part to stop the moron pouring raw iodine on an open wound and the glancing blow to the jaw was accidental and dropped the charge. It was fully recorded in Italian police records and is the only record of any criminal charge being laid against him in his entire life. The 20th of April, 1889 to the 20th of April, 1982. It still appears as the only record with any hint of criminal activity about him on modern technology based criminal record searches. It transferred to digital records when computers took over. The authorities took him in for questioning based on his claim to be Kaiser Adolf Hitler the Hohenzollern, listed as missing since December 1943. Some people had been pretending a female found dead in a bunker in Berlin in mid-1945 made over by a film production crew to look like him, including authentic costume, was him dead instead on television, since it had become commercially available to the public after World War II. He didn't know what a television was at the time. He had seen Sadie Einstein sitting in front of a box that caused her face to be lit up with flickering light, without any sound involved. But he had never seen the front of it, or heard any audio.